Welcome to Norm, Bridging the Gap Between Applications and Databases. Um, today, we're going to talk about life without ORM. Is it possible and how can we get there? In this talk, Hetty's going to present the approach developed and implemented at Bravient Holdings. Um, Norm allows building performant and scalable applications and is praised by developers for the ease of use. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers. I'm based in New York. And I hope everyone is um, staying safe and healthy. I'm here with Henrietta Dombrovska. Uh, she's a database researcher and developer with over 35 years of academic and industrial experience. She holds a PhD in computer science from the University of St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, and at present, she's the Associate Director of Databases at Bravient Holdings in Chicago active member and a frequent speaker at Postgres conferences, um, which is how I know Hetty, um, and a researcher focused on developing efficient interactions between applications and databases. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Hetty. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for inviting me to talk here. I'm delighted to talk. It had been a long time since I talked to <laughs> any professional gathering. Um, so uh, this is not the name of the talk now, what you see on the screen, it's the name of my company. So I'm Associate Director of Databases in Brave and Holdings. And the best thing about this company is that the leadership team allows me to do whatever I want. So I have this unique privilege to build the system exactly how I think it should be. And you know what, also because it's actually a real company, a real industry, finances, if I build it wrong, I will be punished by bottom line. So uh, again, I like being there. Uh, and uh, I did lots of cool stuff there. And I want to, today I want to talk about norm. All right, and why it's not moving here. Okay, Aye. okay. First hiccup because I am not on the right screen. Okay, <laughs> here's norm. So that is the name of our talk. Uh, so uh, our talk because so the talk I'm giving today is almost what I was presenting at the academic conference on Cyprus. The name of the conference was SOFSEM 2020. And I think it was the last conference in 2020, last big conference, because um, we presented in the end of January and then everything started. Um, so um, I was very happy to talk there because uh, I find it very difficult to bring topics like this to academic conferences because nobody believes uh, that it's something worth talking about. Uh, and um, again, uh, there are three offers for this talk. So one is myself. Uh, Jeff Szaplewski is the um, principal uh, system engineer in Bravent Holdings. And um, Boris um, helped uh, us a lot. He actually developed a couple of key functions here, but without these functions, uh, things just won't happen. Um, okay. And uh, when we first submitted this work, we did not have the word norm. Uh, so then uh, while we were getting ready to the conference, we came up with this term norm. So what norm means, it means no ORM, because you know what, we have no SQL, and for some reason people believe that no SQL is the database, we know it's not, because okay, we are Postgres people, we know it's not, but anyway, uh, so uh, that based on no SQL, I thought norm is a good idea. Norm is life without ORM, and that's normal. Living without ORM is normal. So here comes norm, and because we already had our title slide ready, we put it on the side. <laughs> So that everybody are mystified. What is this? What is this? So we'll find out. Again, um, just um, uh, remember that was presented to academic community who do not really know what industry is doing. So I had to fill them in. Okay. All right. So uh, here comes the first slide, computer science and industry. Uh, so how they are related. They're supposed to be actually very closely connected because computer science is like one of the sciences which is like most closely connected to the business. However, here are the hard facts. Right? Most of computer science students never saw real databases. And I can tell you when I come to the conferences and like, okay, I have my laptop, I have the real database here. You know what? They just walk around as like I'm like the most popular person because she has real database on her laptop. So normally they do not see real databases. 
or they just see their like whatever test data sets or whatever you call it, okay? Most, uh, more frightening fact is that most of their professors never saw the real databases either. So they do not know, you know, how the real world looks like. Uh, and uh, because of this, research papers like this never make to the academic conferences. So why they never make them make to academic conferences? Because nobody understands what's about. With us, we always had a problem uh, because it's like, okay, it does not look like databases, why you wouldn't submit it to uh, software engineering conference. A software engineers said that's about databases, why you are doing this. Mm, so SoftSAM was actually a very interesting conference. It was combined database and software engineering. That was the only reason we got submitted. Also, we had connections in the program committee, but reviewers still did not understand what we were doing. So before publication, we had to cut most significant parts from this paper. Uh, so uh, yeah, but still uh, we were very happy to uh, present and uh, uh, like, so you'll see what we presented and a little bit more because I have a little bit more time here. Now, uh, that is my most recent edition and uh, hopefully Lindsay, we can actually um, paste it in the uh, group chat. Uh, when I presented this work a number of times at Postgres conferences, people were asking me, do you have a working example? And I was a little like, eh, you know what, I should probably write it and never did. So a couple of weeks ago, the question came up again and I'm like, okay, you know what, I will do this. So um, if you go to this uh, little repo, uh, you can see the working example of what I will be talking about. And later you can like, you know, you can uh, just, um, Claudette, you can create this example. You can see how all these things work. So you can see it works for real and that's not so difficult. Uh, and uh, you can actually go there right now. It's like a very small repo. So you might see the whole code because in course of this presentation, I will be only uh, showing like small code snapshots. But here is the real thing, real detail, real um, packages. So whatever we developed. All right, moving forward. So I am uh, from industry. I am from finances. So thereby I'm the real capitalist shark. I'm all about money. Uh, it's all should, what should interest me, right? Because, uh, you know, the um, consumer lending online loans, that's evil thing, right? No, we all know, right? They're evil. Uh, the unhumane and by the way that's why we as small business never get uh, government relief because we're evil and by the way we are not welcomed in the state of california hello host uh because we are doing evil business so okay so we're very bad uh and we're all about money uh so here's come the question why i care about something related to application performance and i think you probably know why right because Time is money. When we are talking about time as response time, response time really matters, and it's very important for the financial success. So how exactly? Money by the numbers. Those numbers are actually pretty old. I never saw newer uh, numbers, so let's go with the ones which are like four probably years old. Amazon reported. Uh, that one second page load slowdown results in a loss of uh, 1.6 billion sales. Pretty recent, like one second page, uh, page slowdown. Google reported that slowing search results by 0 0.4 seconds, uh, equivalent of a loss of 8 million searches per day. So you can only imagine how much money is that, right? Uh, but, you know, sad news are that uh, not only this financial loss, but also 50% of visitors abandon the site, which is not loaded within three seconds. And by the way, people have become more impatient because say 15 years ago, it was seven seconds. Then it became less and less. So now actually people say they cannot wait more than like one and a half second, two seconds. So pe people just do not wait till the site is loaded. They abandon the site and even worse, 79% of visitors will never return again. So that's why uh, quick response time is vitally important. 
And you know what? We do not like it. Forget about Google, forget about Amazon. How, how often do you see this? You see it often and you do not like it. So nobody likes it, nobody likes to wait. So that's why we care about wait time, about response time. Now, why does it happen? Why we see all this wait, 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 wait? You know what application developers are saying, right? They're saying database is slow, but we are database people and we know the database is not, but that's what they think. So let's see why this happens, why it is slow. And now uh, here comes the name of our talk, Connecting Galaxies. So why galaxies? When we talk about galaxies, we talk about applications and about databases. You know why we call them galaxies? Because uh, they do know nothing about each other. You will not believe it, but that is true. The applications and databases are developed as if they know nothing about how the other galaxy behaves. And uh, communications are the real issue. So let's look at communications. So we have application model in one galaxy and we have database model in the other galaxy. And you know what is application model? Object-oriented, obviously, right? Because everybody forgot there was something before object-oriented, so we are object-oriented. So what we have in the database side, especially when the database side is Postgres, we have object relational, right? And we have our nice relationships. We think in data sets, we think in bulk and so on. Good. Now they need to talk. This galaxy and that galaxy, they need to talk. You know how they talk? That's how they talk. If you think they just talk to each other, they don't. So that's why this orange line on top is crossed. They talk by means of flat tables. So application disassembles their requests to the database into these microscopic pieces in the singular rows of the flat tables, and then they move it to the database. And they move it through GDBC, which was developed like you know, by previous generation. So they do nothing about complex data types. And uh, you see that between tables and databases, it's just this lines, 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 and we have a little bit of a gap between application and tables. And do you know who sits in this gap? You know, I will tell you. ORM, Object Relational Mapper. So that is our evil creature. So why it is evil? Because the idea was that application developers can develop applications knowing nothing about databases. And ORM uh, is supposed to translate their model into database model. And it does it like in not really efficient way. It's ORM which disassembles the request from the application into this small individual access requests and they are transferred from GDBC and uh, through GDBC they come to database as this like myriads of small queries then they are executed in the database separately and they are transferred back and so it's all like goes that's what happens right so uh yeah you that's our real bottleneck so that's our camel who cannot get through the needle layer okay so it's nice uh Cool picture, you can laugh, you know, like, I mean, you are muted, but you can laugh about this camel, everybody loves this camel. But, uh, okay, uh, so uh, what's, why? Why this is important, why it's a problem. So yeah, that's funny picture, yes, but why it's important that, okay, all right, so it's instead of one query, we have 10 queries, 20 queries, is it a big deal? Actually, it is a big deal because we are talking not about 10 queries, not about 20 queries. So how bad this inefficient interaction can become? Um, the big part of this work, like first phase of this work was done at my previous company at Innova. And there I saw in real time how bad it can become. Because then people actually approached me and said, you know what, we need to do something. So uh, that's how it looked at Innova. Uh, look at this. Uh, 
select. Select star formula one by ID equals whatever, some constant. Um, okay, what can be more simple than this? This is executed fast in milliseconds. This can be never performance problem. Yes, except of when the number of executions is 11 and a half million times per day. So with average execution time less than 10 milliseconds, total execution time about two and a half hours. So for two and a half hours during the day, it executes select star from loan. And uh, if you think, but maybe that's what it's needed, maybe that's how many times users are connected. No, they did not have uh, 11 and a half million sessions. Why it happened? Because the same select was executed within one application endpoint multiple times. And multiple means not 10, multiples means not 20. Some applications controllers would have over 1,000 database calls for each screen refresh. Can you imagine? Like, it's not that many characters on the screen. Like, it's like uh, <laughs> five database calls to display one character or something like this. So between the user hits next and something appears, it's 1,000 database calls. So that's how bad it can become. And you know what? This cannot be improved by anything because when I show these numbers, you know what people are saying, especially software engineers, you need more powerful computers. You need more hardware. So people like to have more hardware. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about this. So in this case, um, with 1,000 executions, worst page response time was over 20 seconds. So with one database query executed for less than 10 milliseconds, the page response time over 20 seconds. Awesome. Okay, so more hardware. This is what people say, so we need more hardware. You know what, <laughs> more hardware doesn't really help because this, all of these had to be executed not in parallel. They had to be executed consecutively. So uh, that time, it was five years ago, so people now think, oh, that is like some old stuff. Yes, it's old stuff, but anyway. Uh, so that's how the uh, computer looked like. It was not on the cloud, not on Amazon, like in-house bare metal. Um, so 500 gigabytes of RAM almost completely used by database disk cache. So with all this, the response time was 20 seconds when we need one. And uh, the um, engineers at the time told us that even the, if they will buy most expensive hardware available, they could only make it twice faster. And we needed to do it 20 times faster. And by the way, uh, yeah, hardware is also being developed. So uh, I left this company four years ago and uh, I talked to their lead DBA recently. And uh, that's what he told me, that current memory size is not half terabyte, but four terabytes, and the response time is still slow. So, yeah, that is that end, but, you know, we are not interested, we know better ways to do it. So, our approach, what we decided to do. So, we looked at these uh, interactions in all, diff all new way. That is our, like, schematic representation of norm, norm being no ORM, ORM replacement. So what is uh, different in our approach? We are not transferring application like, model to database model. Our approach is symmetrical. So we map the application model to the transfer model and database model to transfer model. This mapping is like similar and uh, application and databases can talk with the, uh, using the same terms. So the transfer model is represented in JSON because actually um, object uh, oriented application things in JSON, their objects are JSON objects and we know how to represent JSON objects in Postgres. So then for transferring purposes, these objects are represented as text the only reason why, because JDBC does not know that JSONs existed. So JDBC need to transfer them as flat files. Uh, it's a flat text to text, and that's what we are doing. But other than that, no norm, no, no nothing. So the next slide will be 
kind of, I mean, <sighs> application developers love it because they uh, like the concept of contract because they use the slider to develop application. So our approach is a contract, not between uh, different parts of applications, but between application and database. Uh, so both sides, application and database, convert internal representation into complex hierarchical objects and contract establishes object structure implemented on both sides. So now, for any application endpoint, it takes one database call to transfer data to and from. Okay, to be fair, sometimes not one, sometimes two or three, but that's it. Uh, so we can say one or two. Now, how exactly we are doing this? So I am not sure how convenient it would be to look at this uh, norm repo, but I mean, uh, see for yourself, whatever works for you. Because um, I, what I'm, uh, I will be showing now is kind of loosely based on uh, this repo or the, <laughs> the other way around. Okay, so that is our database schema. It's normal database schema, right? It's normal database objects because each application has users, right? Each application has user account. A anything, anybody selling anything on the web, they have user account. So we have user account, normal user account. And we have username, first name, last name, social security, which we're not supposed to have, but we have it anyway, like all the other people, uh, date of birth or whatever, um, other stuff. Uh, so user account has a email address, maybe multiple because people tend to have multiple email addresses. User might have address, maybe multiple, might have phones, most likely multiple. And uh, this is how we store it in the database because we want to build nicely normalized schema. But if you think about this, it's one object, user account, okay? So what we are mapping this object on? we are mapping it on T object or transfer object. Uh, and we represent it in Postgres by the record type, user defined record type, because thank you, thank you, thank you Postgres, we have this ability to build complex object. Uh, so for user account, we have uh, some information which is uh, like linear uh, and uh, it's related to one user account, like username, or full name, whatever. Uh, and then we have multiple address objects embedded in this user account object, multiple phone objects and multiple email objects. And all this is represented um, by the record types and I will show you in a second how exactly it is represented. So that is implementation detail. So now actually there will be stuff from this reporting kind of. So we want to get all information from the database to the application in one database call. So theoretically we want to have one select, start from basic select. Uh, and uh, if you think that, uh, you, know, you, you think uh, you cannot go wrong with this one. So if you can imagine, if people are using ORM to build their applications, there may be four different database calls. One select username, another select SSS, the other select date of birth, because that's how ORM works. Uh, they have methods, they do not know what's inside. So. At the minimum, we want to have one database call to select everything. Now, what we are doing next? We are creating a type. So that is our user account record, user account, username, social security, date of birth. And uh, when we select, we convert this result to the user account record. That is all good, but as we said, we need to have complex objects inside. So we create the address record, the phone record, uh, the email record, and then we have a composite type. So now user account has some scalar values and some uh, sets of records inside. So Postgres allows this because Postgres is cool and awesome and 
Postgres uh, actually stores information about all these embedded types correctly, internally. Externally, it actually keeps it to itself. So if you want to build a function which returns this type, just like I said, if you want to do subselects and subselects will return these sets, uh, there will be something very interesting. So if you will try to do this, you'll see that uh, it will actually uh, return these record sets as some like text strings with lots of uh, like internal interesting characters. So that's where all my previous attempts to uh, communicate with applications and application developers would fail because uh, like complex uh, record, record types are not returned properly. So that's what first we did. So first, uh, okay, what we wanted to do first, we had this function okay so we uh, returned uh, this record sets from the function and when we were returning the definitions of the nested types were lost so the application could not process it uh, the way how they were defined that was the first take of what we can do because before that we were not even thinking about json and that's okay we now have JSON types in Postgres and we can build JSON object. So here what we're doing, we're building address inside user account and uh, we can return and ooh, everything actually looks perfect because now application can read uh, this object correctly and it does not have any weird symbols. So then we said, okay, uh, maybe we can wrap the whole thing in JSON, and we did, okay? And uh, we started to return nice and beautiful JSON. So um, that's how it looks like. Uh, and if uh, you kind of recall what we talked about like five minutes ago about models, so this way we mapped D object or database object into T object or like transfer objects, okay? Uh, so, what we had remaining problem. So when, if we uh, return JSON, not the record type from the function, we lose strong types. And strong types are important and not only for us. Application developers think they are not important, but actually they also do not like to receive a field which was not in their contract. So actually they want us database to check strong types on the other side. So we still wanted to be able to define the strong record types, not like some return some JSON. Like then anybody can return any JSON. You cannot distinguish between user account, user application, user loan, user document, whatever. So um, the other problem is, and when I talk about this, oh, we, we return JSON, but returning JSON is slow. Yes, if you build JSON, in select statement, it is slow. And especially it is slow, not when you select one user, not when you select Henrietta Dombrovska, which may be one in the universe, but if you are selecting John Smith from your uh, database, and even in small database, you can easily have like a 1500 John Smith, uh, then you have a problem because 1500 JSONs uh, will be built slowly. Uh, so, uh, we like in attempt to resolve these problems, we came up with different approach. So this is like schematic representation of this approach. And uh, I promise there will be something clearer. And actually, again, if you look at this Git repo, you'll see how we build this uh, because it looks a little bit horrifying as a schema, but <laughs> what we're saying is simple thing. So that's master detail. Uh, like relation. So if master is a user account in detail, say address. So what we are doing, we are taking the master record and then we are doing array aggregate uh, from the detail type. So that's what is presented on the top. So it's uh, one to M uh, master detail uh, and uh, that's how we group them. So we use array aggregate and uh, Everything is looking pretty good. That's how it looks in Postgres. 
so uh, any select in this situation, any uh, function can return uh, potentially multiple objects because they're search results. Uh, and uh, we um, aggregate the embedded types, a separate array aggregates, and then we aggregate in array the master type. So now, okay, we have all the object structure and there is no JSON yet because building JSON while the go is slow and we do not want it. And now like it's the final touch. That is like our uh, <laughs> only know-how. So if you want to replicate this approach, you can create whatever functions you want, but you must have this function because what it does, it builds JSON when it's already built. So the object structure is already built in the function. Then you just take this function output and then you look at this as a text basically. And then you build JSON from this uh, result and then you convert it to the text. And these text strings uh, can be shipped between database and application through JDBC. It looks super easy when I'm telling you now, so obvious. And this function is so funny, easy, like why nobody came up with this? It was actually a struggle, now I'm not going to lie. We uh, ran into so many hurdles while we were developing it. Uh, just, um, there's so many things which did not work. So I am giving huge credit to our amazing application development team because they were super patient and we did so, uh, so, so many things back and forth, just making sure that it works perfectly. Um, now, uh, about uh, updates. So again, uh, when I first started to present it, the question was, okay, that is cool about selects, but what you are doing with updates, how you are, living without ORM uh, and how you're doing updates. Again, uh, there are, now there are examples in this uh, norm repo, but um, in a nutshell, um, we do the same thing. So when we are updating objects, we are using the same JSON uh, for the T objects, same contract idea. So here, for example, um, we are doing some deletes and some updates. And look, here we have uh, four different tables involved. We still can send one object. Uh, so what we're doing here, we're just disassembling what we sent. So here, for example, we're updating address. So why we're updating address? Because we have address ID. So we know address already exists and we need to update this ID. And we are deleting phone because we have this special um, JSON key command, which says delete. So we're deleting the phone with this ID. Uh, and the second example, we update uh, the name. Why we're updating it? Because there is name and we have a new value for the name and the user account is already there. So we know it's new, not new user account, it's like updating existing. And then um, we are inserting email address. So why we know that by inserting because uh, this email address comes without ID. So that means we do not have it yet. We need to insert it, generate ID and assign it to this user account. So again, I uh, have examples there. Um, Right. So now going to the final stage of this presentation, it works. Uh, so what I mean it works, it works it, uh, that it uh, actually uh, produces wonderful performance. And uh, performance wise, I had this very old slide and I tried to make yesterday some newer slides, uh, but Okay, so this one I created like very long time ago. So the idea was what we were showing here that through the day, the number of executions of functions increases naturally, but through the day, so the low portion of the slides uh, represents that the uh, response time for all of these functions is the same through the day, no matter what. Mm, and uh, this, uh, like picture, this graph represents that the database is growing and uh, whatever database is growing, still the response time of major functions is the same. So what I tried to put here yesterday, <laughs> okay, uh, like 
I'm, I did not edit it, so I'm just honestly leaving this peak. You know what this peak was? There was like this one huge utility function uh, working at 7 a.m. and uh, this kind of like spiked the performance. But forget about the screen spike. So what you can see here uh, through the day, uh, the number of executions actually vary, but the performance time stays stable except of this stupid spike, which I will need to deal with. And um, we have the same picture for all the functions. And by the way, if you look at how long is the execution time, uh, you can see we have like uh, 50, uh, like 150 milliseconds. So that is our like normal execution time. So we are very proud about this because, um, because uh, so remember about like three seconds, right? Not more than one second. So our um, like vast majority of our functions are executed under 100 milliseconds, no matter what. Uh, and uh, the update functions are executed like under two, 300 milliseconds. There may be some spikes, maximum a second. Uh, and um, you know why we were able to achieve this performance? Because we have such an awesome uh, principal engineer and he uh, just decided that they're putting hard time out for application for 10 seconds because nobody can wait for 10 seconds. And if you want to avoid spikes for 10 seconds, you need to make sure that nothing is executed over one second because spikes happen because of like whatever. Uh, so uh, basically our optimization goal uh, whenever we are developing everything everything, everything, everything should run under one second. And again, most of the time it runs under 100 milliseconds. So um, I'm like really proud of this. You know? it's like, okay, uh, so, so that is what we had to show. And uh, now kind of starting to go to conclusion. Uh, so it was academic presentation. So academic presentation has to have related and related work, so related and unrelated. So question which is always asked, so why not to use Mongo? If you want to have JSONs, why not to use Mongo? No, okay, we are Postgres people, so we know why we're not using Mongo, because it's Mongo, because it's not database, right? Privately. <laughs> uh, like, uh, okay, uh, this uh, statement aside, norm allows flexible hierarchies, Manga does not allow flexible hierarchies. Hierarchies are like preset. Uh, the other thing is that a manga does not have the uh, relational search engine capabilities and we have. So we store it in Postgres and we uh, can have this super fast, uh, super optimized Postgres search. Second, why not standard JSON build function? And um, I've shown that at some point we used standard JSON build. Again, the reason is because as we build JSON, as we go, it's just slower. Um, so that's easy. Um, why not to store JSON? So that's another question because thank you people, thank you Andrew Dustin, thank you other people. We can uh, store JSONs and we can index JSONs and we can search by JSON attributes. Again, it is slower. It's not, it's not saying it's slow, slow probably is like, you know, a little bit too hard, uh, but it's way slower than searching by uh, linear attributes. So we just, uh, for, you know, we are gearing towards extremely performant application. And um, other things uh, which I wanted to mention, so TorahDB, um, I actually, I talked to Alvar multiple times because I really wanted the project with him because he literally did the other side of this. So what uh, they're doing, uh, they were converting in the opposite direction. So they were taking stuff from Manga, converting them into Postgres, executing queries in Postgres and sending it back. I really would love at some point of time to collaborate with him and kind of like have these two pieces together. Uh, Postgres, so that's another thing which people often ask, uh, so how you are different from Postgres? Because Postgres is mostly interface and it um, does not allow to put all this uh, complexity inside as we can. Again, you can see examples in the norm repo. So what's next? 
I want to do a lot with this. And uh, one of the reasons why I was so happy for this opportunity to talk here, because I hope that people will be interested in this and maybe somebody will be interested in working with us. Many of these things can be automated. Um, like generation of lots of stuff. Now that we uh, wrote several hundred packages, I think, uh, we know exactly how they should look like. Uh, so we should be able to use JSON schema as a source of contract. Uh, and uh, then um, uh, you can automate uh, types generation. You can automate three quarters of the functions. I mean, there is always room inside for the art of uh, writing super efficient queries, but every each and single object needs to have insert update basic search. And this already wrote so many of them. We just take previous and um, make some updates. This definitely needs to be automated. So uh, extension not again, I put it here because I got lots of questions. Do you want to do extensions? Or even more, I got, or oh, I want to write extension out of this. I'm like, please. And uh, okay, <laughs> that was it. So I'm not sure how extension would look like, but I think that it would be super cool uh, because, uh, you know, that is the most cleanest uh, way of interaction between application and databases. We do not need any ORM. This one has the least possible overhead. It's going directly from database to application in the format which application developers love. Okay. So conclusion. So response time is critical. We know why we need a short response time. Time is money. Uh, dominating technologies do not support interactions in terms of respective models. So if you think about this, there are complex objects in applications, there are complex objects in databases, they do not talk. So current technologies disassemble here, disassemble here, and nothing would come out of it. We can do better. So norm is technology based on the concept of contract. Application developers love contracts. It allows to use the power of DBMS engine. Uh, and still preserve the complex object structures. It can be easily adopted by application developers. And all my previous experiences, it's too complicated. It's too complicated. So you know what? This technology, they love it. They love it because also they can start developing without waiting for the database. Because we have a contract, they know what to expect from us. So we actually integrate we can integrate at the very last stages and everything works so they're happy and um, they're also happy. And uh, also this helps develop high performance applications without maxing out on hardware resources. So it's like great source of cost reduction. Okay, uh, all right, you know what? I'm actually done because I just saw first question and but I'm actually done so I can answer questions like because next slide is basically questions questions so we can uh, finish with this presentation and uh, I can go ahead with the questions I can actually stop sharing if I will figure out how right okay all right okay cool okay so uh, oh, where is the question mm, okay da, 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 da. Uh, what have you observed about the size of the data uh, transported uh, for JSON versus standard uh, result processing? Uh, okay, uh, it doesn't, so that's the thing is that we are not transporting JSONs. We are transporting uh, text. Uh, so um, it does not matter what is the format. I mean, yes, uh, transferring bigger data volumes, it will be slower. So for example, I can tell you, um, our application now times out on one occasion, on one occasion, when our uh, customer apps accidentally put in the search uh, state of Texas and nothing else. So when they <laughs> search for everybody in the state of Texas, then yes, it times out. Uh, so uh, other than that, uh, yeah. So um, again, complex objects are built 
on the database side and returning uh, everything in one select it always faster than returning multiples the other thing is that uh, you will never display this all these people from the state of texas right so uh, when we're talking about um, ltp application that means we're talking about some like <laughs> reasonable amount of data which needs to be displayed uh, again there are lots of techniques how to uh, kind of you know work with what actually needs to be retrieved versus what potentially can be retrieved but yeah uh, otherwise uh, yeah that's that's the beauty that it's no difference whether it's complex or not complex the transfer time is the same Right. Um, I don't know. So, Linda, uh, do you want to like continue with um, uh, chat? Because technically, again, I'm done with presenting. You can like unmute people if they want. Hi, Henrietta. Um, Lindsay here. Yes. I see a question um, that was submitted about seven minutes ago. Um, I don't think you've answered it yet. Are further optimizations possible? And if so, what is the next step? Um, okay. Um, okay, in the words of the paper. So yeah, so the paper, okay. So the paper is the publication. So I do have a link, but um, this is, uh, you need to pay to get the paper basically because this publication. Uh, further optimizations. Okay, so um, the, Part of this is how you optimize the actual database query, right? Because, um, I mean, if you use this approach, it's kind of the optimal uh, interaction between application and database. I uh, am pretty confident you cannot have things more optimal. But how you run query on database, it's a separate story because now, again, the beauty of this approach is that you can optimize a query based on, like, based on the query itself. Like say, uh, account search. You can search by uh, like something on address. You can search something on the phone. You can search something on like last name, first name, whatever. And by the way, again, if you look at this repo, uh, there, are, there is a search function. So there are two functions because I did not want people to start reading this horrific generic search before they even <laughs> get from <laughs> the rest of this. Um, so there is one basic search, which you do not need to have it. I just have it so for the ease of reading. But then there is like complex search and uh, you can search there by email or by phone or by something. And you can see that what I'm doing there, I'm generating different queries based on what is the search criteria. So that's the beauty of it, because for the application, it does not matter. They just send you the search JSON, and then you use your own optimization powers, because you know what? All the optimizers are cool and awesome, but still humans are better than any optimizer. I mean, optimizers are written by humans, anyway. but anyway, there is for any optimizer, there is a situation when humans can do it better. <laughs> All right. Uh, 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 back and code. Um, okay, so the question: How about looking into techniques used by graphs? So back and code meaning what? The application code? What was the question? I'm not sure. Can whoever asked it to clarify? Can somebody clarify what, what was about the uh, what back end code means in this question? Okay. Uh, to generate to generate database functions yes so that's what i said that uh, we want to have the mechanism to generate some uh, database functions again uh, i uh, i work for the small company so everything what i'm doing here is out of my work hours so that is something which i would gladly gladly have somebody partnering with me and uh, generating some basic functions. As I said, generating types, it can be automated. Generating basic inserts, basic updates definitely can be automated. There are some things which cannot be automated. It's some non-standard searches. But again, 80% to 90% of searches can be automated. That's something that I'm looking for, yes. Again, I do not know whether it can be ever packaged as an extension, but I will embrace this opportunity. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, 
Uh, yes. Any anything about? Uh, do we have to worry about concurrency and uh, locking? Uh, no, uh, not. Uh, it does not matter. It's no difference between this approach and like uh, embedded SQL or whatever. Because um, the thing is that um, we are talking about the realm of all TP systems. So the small queries, the large number of short queries. So we do not anticipate any lockings, and that is select anyway. Uh, so the, again, the thing is that each of those uh, functions is executed kind of the same time as single select. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's why yeah. we're doing it. Yeah, yeah, like, like you know, it, it, you're right. It is, it is no different than the traditional way. Uh, I was just wondering when you write a function and you are passing back, say, a JSON and yeah. asking for some deletes, Yes. And so somebody beat me to it. Somebody already deleted those records. That, that it has, it's, it's not faster. Again, it's same locking mechanism is for single deletes. Because if you looked at the execution time, so right. the most complex, and this, I mean, in my GitHub, it's like simple version, but we have it like actual huge Mastodon function where we have lots of embedded objects um, and everything is executed as one function, it's still under half a second. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so now that's, that's the thing that because uh, when we can package several queries which are executed on the server, uh, the extra time for like 10 qu uh, queries instead of one is way, way less than uh, shipping 10 separate uh, queries between the application and database. So that was the goal. That was my goal for many years. But like here at Breven Holdings, it was the first time when I had enough support from the application development team and from the tech leadership to actually see how it will work. <laughs> okay. Well, one, one, one other question. Do we, do we also have to worry about, in some cases, um, somebody sending back a very large object? Like when you say you're selecting and say, just for the sake of our example that we have here, you bring him back a, uh, a user object mm -hmm. and he may have maybe hundreds of addresses that he moved across and hundreds of phone numbers. And at the end of the day, when you bring all that back, you have a huge object. Do we have yes. to worry about it? Yeah. No, I mean, it will time, it will time out, uh, like, as I said, you know, because we have like once a week, we have one uh, sell, uh, one customer rep who does select uh, where state equals TX period and accidentally press OK. So this time's out, because, not because of the data volumes. I mean, the data volumes, uh, I mean, whatever we have, whatever like our flow output allows, uh, it will just unfortunately time out because it will take time to bring all this complex object for the state of Texas because we have lots of customers in the state of Texas. Right, and, and that one here, it will, it will break on the database side. No it, otherwise... no, it won't break. No, it won't break. I mean, if it wouldn't be timing out, it, it will not. Um, I mean, we have some utilities which are also built on the same thing, like we load a huge universe files, we load like um, like big files which we are preparing for mass mailing. We have millions of records and uh, I mean, we operate with them. That's okay. Yeah, because the way, the way I look at it is you are building this whole object on the mm -hmm. server side. Yes. And you are... Whereas the other way around, if you use ORM, you will be basically buffering the records across the wire as mm -hmm. they select. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, oh, this does not, I mean, <laughs> this does not make it uh, long. I mean, uh, we are not uh, like exhausting the capacity of <laughs> transfer layer. Again, uh, we are not speaking about, I do not know, printing Wikipedia over the wires, this, like, uh, this OLTP stuff. Some of these technologies can be actually used for reporting. We use some of these technologies for, the, uh, for our data warehouse, but they are kind of, you know, modified to be used on the data warehouse environment. Now, the good part uh, about using some of this in data warehouse, because uh, often we need to have reporting uh, kind of like in the application. And what I experienced previously at my previous places of work, like uh, something is calculated in the application using some um, Ruby on Rails methods, like 70 database calls, they produce one number. 
uh, and then uh, the reporting team wants to have this number in their reports, like, I cannot give it to you, I don't have it. I have this like Ruby method. Uh, so at least now everything is in a database so we can, uh, uh, and um, you know, a couple of years ago, I think I presented my little trick how to call functions remotely, which you cannot do in Postgres, but you can if you try. So yeah, we're using some of these little metrics. Uh, okay, um, or about Sprinter. Okay, so uh, you know what? I checked actually with my co-author. Um, uh, uh, we, we need to check uh, whether, yeah, so whether I can email the text. I will check about this because uh, I am not sure whether we, uh, whether we can email the text. But you know what? Again, for the practical purposes, uh, I think uh, the report like works better because uh, as I said, that was academic paper. And first we had to uh, reformat it and rewrite it because uh, for these countries they had different uh, formatting requirements. So we had to reduce it like uh, to like one, like a little bit over the half. And then at the end, because nobody understood what it was, they said, okay, that will go as a short paper, reduce it like to yet another. So. <laughs> <laughs> we just love having the publication, but um, honestly, it's like, I don't think it's that much in it. Uh, I mean, for somebody who actually wants to try to, to use it. But I will, I will check whether we can, I think we can privately send it by email, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you know what, I, um, I don't know, I created this report like two weeks ago and I was like, why I never thought about this? Because people ask for so many times. And um, I presented again this paper in the Chicago Park because first time we went online and uh, I just did not want to subject anybody from this supper. So I decided I will do it myself. Uh, and uh, then people asked, so like, if we want to start, what we will do? And I'm like, why I never did this? <laughs> so cool. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad I, I created this repo. So I, I hope that this will be kind of, you know, uh, this getting started thing here. And uh, I really will really, really appreciate the, any feedbacks and anything, you know, because I'm, um, I want this technology to become more common. When we came up with the term norm, I started to use it all the time because I just want people to use it. I want people to know what we mean because for several years it was this JSON finger, like literally I was saying this. So our JSON finger. So now at least we have a word, we call it norm. And um, I do not like to be a person who have this like, you know, like, possess this sacred knowledge and nobody else can do it. Because if we are talking about technology, we need to have a technology that can be easily used by other people. And I really think that uh, the, one of the biggest hurdles for performance now is using ORMs, even the best of ORMs, you know, even like um, the ones which are decent. So I really, really want people to like take a look learn this technology, love this technology, and use it. Okay, transaction isolation, okay. Which transaction isolation level? Um, you know what, whatever we have, because functions are atomic. Uh, so that's, that's the thing that, uh, that is something which I was very unhappy when I started with Postgres like about, 10 years ago, I think, because I came like uh, from being Oracle person for a very long time and before Cybers person for a very long time. And uh, I like was so upset that <laughs> functions are atomic and we cannot build anything. But actually here it works for us. Does not matter what isolation level, we never had to, I mean, let me see. No, there's one place in application where we had to uh, play with isolation level, but it does not uh, depend on the functions. We have only one place where potentially can have the race condition. But other than that, that's another beauty. Function is atomic, no matter what isolation level. Function is one operator. You cannot uh, like execute half of the function. It will never be committed, no matter of isolation level. 
Okay, uh, I understand the comment post. Uh, um, uh, okay, you know what? No, okay, this is probably, um, uh, maybe I do not know something about Postgres, but what I looked at, because um, people asked me several months ago, like take a look why, why you are not doing it. So my understanding is that um, from what I read, that uh, they can map uh, tables, they can map views. I think uh, they can uh, map uh, like uh, results of the function. Uh, but um, again, we are using functions exclusively for returning the complex types. So that is something up because for me, that's the all, all the reason why I'm doing all this. We are able to return complex nested types. And that is something which I did not see there. And if I did not look close enough, I apologize, but that's like, that was my research. Right. Okay, anything, anything else? Like so weird to talk and everybody are silent, you know? <laughs> Just, <laughs> I, that's what I do not like about uh, Zoom. But everybody are typing, nobody's talking. Right. We thank you very much. Yeah, very we welcome. Enjoyed. We enjoyed your talk very much. And uh, are you going to be sharing the, uh, I mean, I already have a link to your, uh, to your GitHub. Yes, uh, actually the, um, the version of this presentation is already there. Exactly the one which I gave in Cyprus in January. This one is a little bit more expanded because like I knew I have a little bit more time here. So I just added a couple of slides. I can put it, but uh, like 90% of slides are already there. I made it as accessible as possible. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you very you're much. very welcome. We'd, yeah. we'd like to have you in Texas someday. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. You know what? Yeah. So, sometime, maybe, you know, when we will be able to travel again. I hope so. I hope it will happen. Yeah. Right. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so yes, please uh, reach out. Like I would really love somebody trying using it. I would really love to hear how your experience goes. You know, with my other repo, uh, EPG by Temporal, people started to put um, like issues there. I'm so happy because now uh, that's another thing which is developing against all odds. So people are cloning and uh, there I have lots of people actually posting questions and asking me to explain how things work. And uh, so I, uh, but that one is like several years old now. So I hope that, you know, uh, I will have some feedback in this report and yes. Please let me know how I can improve it and how I can like make life better. We are hoping to have some uh, like um, applications there. So a couple of people told me they will write easy like small Java app or small Ruby app uh, so that uh, you know we can show how these functions can be used by the application developers. So again, if somebody will be interested in doing this, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope to see you soon. All right. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.